Uh, hello and welcome to today's Bible reading. This is for Sunday, July the 9th, 2023. We are going to be starting in Psalms uh, using the Kingdom Bible reading plan generated by Logos. And this is one, uh, if you remember, it is designed to go through the Psalms twice. It goes through the whole Bible, but it goes through the Psalms twice. So we'll be seeing Psalms 7 and 8 today. And then we'll go into Psalm 48, and then 1 Samuel chapter 9, and then we'll finish it out in Mark chapter 2. So if you want to get your Bibles and open up to Psalm chapter 7, that's where we'll be starting. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel and then hit the notification bell so you'll know whenever I add content to the channel. Comment on these videos, like these videos, share these videos, you know all that. You hear me say it in every video. Psalm 7 is where we're going to start if you want to open your Bible or your Bible app, whichever you're using. And I will get my monitor over here set up. So there we go, Psalm 7. And then let me get down here and I will go into the uh, screen share mode, or as I call it, postage stamp. Okay, Psalm 7 should be up there on the screen, so let's begin. Psalm 7, prayer and praise for deliverance from enemies, a meditation of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. O Lord my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from those who persecute me and deliver me, lest they tear me like a lion, rendering me in pieces while there is none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is iniquity in my hands, if I have repaid evil to him who was at peace with me, or have plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue and overtake me. Yes, let him trample my life to the earth, and lay my honor in the dust. Selah. Arise, O Lord, in your anger, lift yourself up because of the rage uh, of my enemies rising up before me to the judgment you have commanded. So the congregation of the people shall surround you for their sakes, therefore a return on high. The Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity with me. O let the wickedness of the wicked come to me, uh, come to an end, but establish the just for the righteous. God tests the hearts and minds. My defense is of God who saves the upright in heart. Verse 11, God is a just judge and God is angry with the wicked every day. And if he does not turn back, he will sharpen his sword. He bends his bow and makes it ready. He also prepares for himself instruments of death. He makes his arrows into fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head. His violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. And then we come into Psalm 8. Psalm 8, the glory of the Lord in creation to the chief musician on the instrument of Gath, the Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength, because of your enemies, they, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And now uh, we'll turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9, Saul chosen to be king. Now remember last time we left off, uh, the people had demanded a king. Samuel didn't want to do it, but God said, no, go ahead. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Go ahead and give him a king. He laid out what was going to happen uh, if they had a king other than God. And now here we're going uh, uh, to the selection of the king. Because there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of uh, Abel, the son of Zero, the son of uh, Bechorah, the son of Aphahai, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. 
and he had a choice and a handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel, for the from his shoulders upward he was taller than any of the people. Now I don't know how tall that is. If people then were, you know, I'm five foot nine, so if someone uh, say was five foot nine or maybe even shorter than that in those days, he's probably my best guess, well over six feet tall. So he's going to stand out from the crowd. Uh, Verse 3, the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost, and Kish said to his son Saul, Please take one of the servants with you, arise and go look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and through the land of uh, Shalashah, but did not find them. Then they passed through the land of uh, Shalem, and and they were not there. Then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but he did not find them. And when they had come into the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servants who was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys and become worried about us. So they've been gone quite a while looking for these donkeys, which is normal because they were uh, probably part of their livelihood, of their farm, and and uh, however that they uh, made their living. Uh, typically, uh, it just says the donkeys got lost, but typically donkeys were used for pulling plows and things like that. So it, it's important that you find them. Kind of like horses were important uh, in the settlement of the West, uh, of the United States. And he said to him, look now, there is a city, of a, a, a city, a man of God. Let me try that again. And he said to him, look now, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. And all that he says surely comes to pass. So let us go and perhaps he can show us the way that we should go. And Saul said to his servant, But look, if we don't, uh, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread of our vessels is all gone, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What shall we? Uh, what do we have? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Look, I have here at hand one fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give that to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus. Come, let us go to the seer, for he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. Then Saul said uh, to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went up to the city where the man of God was. And as they went up, to the, to, went up the hill to the city, they met some young women coming out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? And they answered and said, Yes, there he is just ahead of you. Hurry now, for today he came into the city, because there is a sacrifice of the people today on the high place. And as soon as you come into the city, you will surely find him before he goes up to the high place to eat meat, or uh, to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice, and afterward those who are invited will eat. Now therefore go up, for about this time you will find him. So they went up to the city, and as they were coming up to the city, there was Samuel coming out toward them on his way to the high place. And that's where they built their altars and places of worship, typically. High places really means a hill. And then because, you remember, heaven's up there, so we want to be as close to heaven as we can get. So we'll build our altars and, and our places of worship on uh, hills. And that's when we see later on in Kings... Uh, when a certain you know, Israeli king would come along and suddenly destroy all the high places. That's what he's doing, is he's destroying the, the various pagan altars uh, that have been uh, set up on hills. And so uh, they want to find out from uh, Samuel, see if he can help them find these donkeys. And so now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came, tomorrow about this time I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, And you shall anoint him commander over my people, Israel, that he may save my people from the land of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people, because their cry has come to me. So when Samuel saw saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me where is the seer's house. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today and tomorrow, and I will go and tell you all that is in your heart. But as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found. 
and on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and on your father's house? Saul answered him and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak to me like this? You know, hey, Benjamin, there's nothing special about being a Benjamite or about my family. We're just average Joes, or, or um, I don't know if they had average Joes then or not. There's nothing special about us. We're not millionaires. We're not political leaders or anything like that. So verse 22. Now Samuel took Saul and his servants and brought them into the hall and had them sit in the place of honor among those who were invited. There were about 30 persons, and Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion which I gave you, of which I said to you, set it apart. And so the cook took up the, high, uh, the thigh with its upper part and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Here it is. What has uh, what was kept back? It was set apart for you. Eat, for until this time it has been kept for you since I said I invited the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. When they had come down from the high place into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the top of the house. They arose early, and it was about the dawning of the day that Samuel called to Saul on top of the house, saying, Get up that I may send you on your way. And Saul arose, and both of them went outside, and he and Samuel. And now here's where we're anointing him king. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servants to go ahead of us. And he went on, But you stand here while that I may announce to you the word of God. Now, well, this is a terrible chapter break uh, between 9 and 10, because we're this, this is like uh, the, the, the show... That's a two-part, the TV show you've watched an hour, and now it says, to be continued. And you're thinking, oh, man, it's a cliffhanger. i got to wait a week to find out what happens. Well, you don't have to wait a week, but we'll find out tomorrow uh, what happens uh, in this. Okay, and then going back to Psalm 48. The glory of God in Zion, a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the in his holy mountain, Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. For behold, the kings assembled. They passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled. They hastened away. Fear took that hold of them there, and a pain as a woman in birth pangs, as when you break the ships of the Tarshish with an east wind. As we, ha as we have heard, so when we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. Selah. Verse 9. We have thought, O God, of your loving kindness in the midst of your temple, according to your name. O God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad. Because of your judgments, walk about Zion and go all around her, count her towers, mark well her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that you may tell it in uh, to the generations following. For this is God, our God forever and ever, and he will be our guide even to death. And then our last reading is Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, Jesus forgiving and heals a par par paralytic. And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not uh, come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was laying. And Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And, and some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. 
Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Okay, just wanted to take a second here and, and show you some things. Now, this is a typical American house, and I picked this one for a reason that it's not really relevant to, uh, to, to this lesson. But I want you to notice this frame here. And the roof. It's a one-story house. And uh, this is what I pictured them doing when they took the roof off. Remember, see all the tiles and shingles up there, and they're pulling all that off and lowering this guy in. Uh, well, that's not really how it worked. See, the houses in those days were different than ours. See, this is a first-century house. This is a cutaway of it. And uh, sometimes there would be this level up here where they're uh, probably, that looks like a bed there, and like they're uh, going to be sleeping there, but they weren't particularly tall. You can see here's a man, and there's the door uh, way here isn't much taller than he is, because many times in those days the houses would be like one, maybe one large room, and it wouldn't be much taller than the people in it. So you would have enough room to stand up in, and that was about it. So when they are getting up there on the roof, here's one. It's a more modern one, obviously. You've got this person sitting here. But notice it's not a particularly tall one. Notice the thatch, and there's rocks up here holding it down, and and there's a very small window there. So this is probably closer to what they were taking off, uh, rocks and maybe some grass and thatch and that sort of thing, so that um, uh, they're not doing the modern tile. You always got to stop and think about what would have been happening in those days, what would their uh, houses have been like, and the culture, and not necessarily... Uh, what we're doing uh, today. So uh, that's what that is. It's not a big monstrosity like we would picture uh, today. It was, a, it was probably a small house and, and not that tall. So anyway, back to our reading now. Uh, verse 13, Then he went again out by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, you know, just think about it. You roll out of bed in the morning. Hey, I'm feeling pretty good today. I think I'm going to go call the doctor or my car. It's not making any noise. It's running smooth. I think I'm going to take it to the mechanic. Well, that's not the way it works. I get up. I'm not feeling well. Yeah, and it's been a couple of days. I need to go to the doctor or my car is making that weird knocking noise. I need to go to the mechanic. The righteous uh, if we were perfect and didn't uh, had no sin, we wouldn't have needed Jesus. Problem is, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, so we all need Jesus. The difference between these sinners and tax collectors and the Pharisees is the sinners and tax collectors know they're sinners. The Pharisees just think they're perfect and never do anything wrong. So we don't ever want to get to that state of mind where we're thinking that we're doing it all right and have it all figured out. But then Jesus now is going to be questioned about fasting, because in verse 18, the disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came to him and said, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and in uh and then they will fast in those days. No one ever sews a piece of unshrunk, unshrunk cloth onto an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away the old and the tear is made worse. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but new wine must be put into a new wineskin. Now it happened when he went through the grain field on the Sabbath, as they were uh, went to as and as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, "Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath?" But he said to them, "Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, and he uh, and those with him? 
how you went to the house of God in the days of Abathar the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and also gave some to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord uh, of the Sabbath. Yes, a couple of things. Looking, uh, going back up to the healing of the par paralytic, you know, this was to prove Jesus had the ability to forgive sins. Now, sitting there and saying to somebody, your sins are forgiven, that's not something you can see. That's not something quantifiable. You can, that's one of those things you can say like, oh, well, you know, you're healed of your cancer or something that you can't see. It's inside. You can't see it. So how do you know? So Jesus proved he had the power to conquer the invisible, if you will, by showing the visible. Take up your bed and go home and walk, be healed, that sort of thing. And that really surprised them. Uh, the, the Pharisees, the fact that he was able uh, to do that. But he's sitting there <clears throat> uh, trying to show them he's got the authority from God, and that's one of the ways to do it, is to do miracles like that. And then uh, the, the uh, eating of grain. Now, Now, one of the things to understand about fasting, let's back up before we do the eating of grain. One of the things to understand about fasting is it was not commanded uh, in the old law uh, in one place on the Day of Atonement. is about the only place where it's kind of inferred because where they are supposed to afflict their souls, according to Leviticus 16, verse 29. But it had become a big part of Jewish life by the time Jesus uh, came around. So the Pharisees fasted usually two days a week on Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, and from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., because that's how they measure a day, and then 6 p.m. is nighttime, and uh, like today is Saturday, so the Sabbath actually began. Now, as far as uh, their fasting, the Old Testament did not command fasting. Uh, Leviticus 16.29 talks about afflicting their souls, and it's kind of implied or taken from that that it's, it ties into fasting. But by Jesus' time, fasting was become a, a pretty important part of Jewish life. Pharisees typically fasted on two days a week, usually Mondays and Thursdays, uh, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., because that was how they measured the day. And then the next day actually started after 6 p.m. So the Sabbath on the Jewish calendar actually begins at 6 p.m. Friday or sundown Friday and runs to sundown on Saturday. Uh, so about 6 o'clock or so Saturday, give or take. And, um, you know, I grew up in Alaska and I would. I've never asked, but I don't know how they handle the sun up to sundown thing when you only have four hours of daylight. But that's another issue for another discussion. And so they believe, the Pharisees did, that all this self-denial would lead to great blessings from God. So they did everything they could to make sure everybody knew they were fasting by, by you know, going around frowning and, um, you know, tearing their clothes and things, calling people to them to pray. They may just made sure everything that they did was known. But uh, now for Christians, fasting's not commanded, but it's not forbidden. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, remember, he said, when you pray, when you fast, when you do that. So there is an assumption there that he uh, assumes we're going to fast and we're going to pray. Yeah, it's been a while, but I have a fasted occasionally, and it's something I typically take a couple of days to prepare myself for. Well, it's more of a mental thing than it is a physical thing. Now, of course, if you're diabetic or you've got other physical problems, you might not be able to fast. So now, looking uh, at his uh, the picking of grain and eating in the field, you know, the Sabbath was not meant to restrict necessities. You know, people have to eat. We have to breathe, okay? So there are some things we were never uh, meant to stop on the Sabbath. And if you're looking at verse 25 and 26, that's when David was fleeing from Saul. It refers back to 1 Samuel chapter 21. And he took five loaves of the showbread that was eaten only by the priest, and he gave it to his men. And the man, uh, David, you know, the man of God, justified was justified in breaking. This was the ceremonial law. This was not the moral law. He had a need for sustenance. He had to eat. And that was greater than keeping the ceremonial law. Uh, so that's what that's about. There was the moral law, which is, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not uh, commit adultery, those kinds of things. But the ceremonial law was something different. And so um, 
they seem to have also the Pharisees forgot Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So uh, David broke the ceremonial law, and also keep in mind he was not indulging in a lust, but he was meeting a genuine need. It wasn't like he had just finished eating a huge meal and thought, oh, there's the showbread, I think I'll eat that too. No, his men were, they were in, in at war, basically, and they needed uh, the, the nourishment. Also, Jesus points out that the Sabbath was made to serve man, uh, not man to serve the day. And so the original intent of the Sabbath got warped by tradition. Uh, and that's seen um, uh, in throughout history. In fact, uh, Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, uh, massacred a group of Jews under the command. This is during the Maccabean era, which is uh, between the Old and New Testament. And the Maccabee, uh, the, the, the uh, Judas Maccabees, uh, band of men refused to defend themselves. Why? Because they were attacked on the Sabbath. Uh, so there wouldn't have been anything wrong with them defending themselves. There's my take on it. And then the Sabbath was given to man out of the grace of God. He gave us a day, uh, uh to rest. And that is something to think about. We got 24 hour commerce now because of the internet. Uh, and then prior to COVID, Walmart and a lot of stores like that would stay open 24 hours. Do we really need that, though? Did God maybe know what he was talking about when he said to keep the Sabbath? Now, today we don't live with the Sabbath. The, the Sabbath is Saturday. Churches, Christians worship on Sunday. But uh, it used to be there was a time when businesses shut down on Sunday. And some places, especially in the South, Wednesday was treated a lot like Sunday. Businesses closed because you had prayer meeting Wednesday night. Or if they opened on a Wednesday, if a business opened on Wednesday, it would close around noon or maybe a few hours earlier. So you could make sure you got to prayer meeting or to Bible study or whatever your congregation, your church had. So Jesus is trying to set them straight on some of their own misconceptions of the Sabbath. Jesus is telling them, look at verse 28. He says there that it is far more important to know Jesus uh, and have that relationship with Jesus than it is to keep rules and rituals. Jesus is greater than the Sabbath, and rules and rituals cannot save, but Jesus can save, and he will if those of us who, out of faith, uh, are baptized into Christ because uh, he told us to do it. And because Peter said to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice he didn't say to pray a prayer or do anything like that. He gave them a specific answer to a specific question. So that's going to wrap it up for today's Bible reading and devotional. Appreciate you joining us. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and then hit that notification bell and comment on the video. Send me your uh, sermon requests or Bible questions to timothy4.2.3 at gmail.com or you can leave them in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video. I'm out of here.